into it because uh, when I left the house, Ricky Fowler was on top of the leaderboard of the M3 championship in golf. Y'all know I love to get it in. I'm on the golf course a lot. I did get spanked the other day, but that's okay. Um, shout out to, uh, I got to shout out to everybody at the Teach My Knees first annual tournament that was uh, a week ago. I had a blast. I won't forget it. Uh, everybody who was there uh, had a blast, and then they had the DJ on, on the 10th hole, and, and it's like right when I was driving up to the 10th hole, they queued Menti Rosa up, and we were acting the fool out there. So, uh, shout out to my man George Martinez, and of course Mr. Chichmanin, the legend, and his museum, 
uh, which it was all for. Um, it was for a great cause, and we raised a lot of money for his for his museum. So I'm happy to be a part of that. People, people, they got to get over before you go under. Shout out to everybody in Southgate. Shout out to everybody in Linwood. Shout out to everybody in Hunter Park. Shout out to everybody in Bell, Cutterhay, Bell Gardens, and the whole nine. That's where I grew up at. If you're checking in with us, we appreciate you. I see R.D. Flores is in the house. What up to my day ones? Absolutely. Uh, Dylan. Is that Dylan? Let me get this for a little bit. Uh, yeah. Thank you for checking in with us. Guys, uh, let's get right into it. In baseball um, this week, it seems like nothing's changed since last week. He's, it's the, uh, the Boston Red Sox on top of the Devil Ray by, I believe it's a game or two. And uh, uh, the Yankees are fading fast, people. So New York City, you might want to get out there and rep your Yankees in the American League. Central Division is the Chicago Cubans running away with it on the Cleveland Indians. Um, shout out to Yasmani Grandal, Pito Aurel, Toro Paisano por allá, haciendo su cosa, and, and, and getting it in real heavy. Shouts out to the White Sox. Okay, I call them the Chicago Cubans. In the West, it's the Houston Astros on top of the Oakland A's by, I believe, three games. And they're kind of like a, we want to get it. The Angels, if you're an Angels fan, oh, it's looking bad, people. You're about 10 games out, and uh, I don't think there's enough Sohei Otani uh, to bring them back up. Uh, let's go to the National League. Of course, in the East, it's the New York Mets, the Philadelphia Phillies, and the Atlanta Braves in that order. The Braves, although they look like the stronger team, they're back, they're back about five games. So uh, the New York Mets are ruling it right there, right now. And in the Central Division, it's still the Milwaukee Brewers over the St. Louis Cardinals by a few games there. In the West, the San Francisco Giants got a two-game lead over my beloved Dodgers. <laughs> Anyways, we just finished the All-Star breaks. So you already know the Dodgers turned it on after that. And we run away with, with, the, with the league. You know what I mean? That's what's up. But if you're in San Francisco right now, shout out to you. No disrespect. The Padres are fading. Just like I said early on in the beginning of the season, they just, I don't know. I don't know. They got a lot of star power. Manny and, and my man Tatis. And then Cuban at that first base. But it's just, you need some pitching, people. You need, you need some pitching. And that is baseball. In the NBA, uh, congratulations to the Milwaukee Bucks for your win in the finals against the Phoenix Suns. It was a great series. I didn't watch it. I didn't care. It's the Lakers. The Lakers weren't in it, people. But uh, I saw I saw glimpses. I saw glimpses. You man, Gian, uh, Giannis, I believe, got the MVP award. Uh, enough respect to him. In football, American League, I mean, uh, American Football League, uh, news. not too much right now. They're in training camp. But uh, DeAndre Hopkins of the Arizona Cardinals did take a shot at league officials for their vaccine protocol. He ain't with it. He's not liking it one bit because he's a non-vaxxer. Now, this is a sensitive uh, subject. I get it. Uh, you know, I, I feel personally... It's up to you um, if that's what you want to do. Um, but if not, you know, I don't know what they're going to do, but I think they're making it mandatory. Um, let me rewind a little bit. Let me rewind a little bit. Can y'all hear, can y'all hear me good? Can y'all hear me good in the chat room? Are we good? I think we're good. I think we're good. I don't know. I don't want to put, put on my glasses. I don't want to put on my glasses just yet. So uh, if you want us to turn the sound up, let me know. Somebody said, ahora sí. Ahora sí. Okay, that's what's up. Let me rewind a little bit and give a shout out to. All right, that's what's up. Let me give a shout out to my man uh, over at 808 Beach Wine. We are rocking you tonight. Uh, Ruben Pacheco, 
Uh, we appreciate your California red wine. It is going down smooth according to Brenda Herrera, who is in the house. She is loving it, and I am having some as well. We salute you, homeboy. Uh, this is a Napa Valley wine, and it's delicious. With a hint of berry in there that is prevalent, but not overpowering. You dig? People are fellow managed. This is the Havana Lounge Podcast. Welcome. And at this time, sponsored by Havana, Havana House themselves. Welcome the man of the hour, the legend, Mr. Enrique Castillo is in the house. Welcome, senor. studies department and American studies uh -huh. um, they started a, a Chicano st uh, theater class and that's where I met Luis and ironically I would he was in Berkeley but I had to go pick him up at San Francisco Airport in my 56 Chevy uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. so, now, so how, how, did you, how did you go from Calexico to Berkeley there was a program at the time, which was the Educational Opportunity Program. Okay. Sure. 
that uh, help with financing. And I grew up as a foreign worker. My parents, my mother, my father were worked the fields. I worked the fields with them. Oh wow! Until my sophomore year in college. Is that right? Yeah. So we migrated north from Calexico from the border all the way up. Uh, worked in asparagus, cantaloupe, uh, figs, lettuce, tomato. And this is the days where, where they used to still crop dust you. you know, so while you were out in the field. While you are out in the field and there were no bathrooms out there. So you know, they pile a bunch of rocks and men and women. Yeah. Although my father, he was kind of a sexist about that. He didn't allow women in his crew. Because he wanted a very fast-moving crew, and he felt that if the women were going to work there, that the guys were going to flirt with them, sure, sure. they were going to help them out. So that was his attitude, you know? Yeah. But as far as the hard work was concerned, he always made sure that my brother and I, uh, he didn't cut us any slack. We had to work, even though we were kids, we had to work like grown men behind him. That was it just you and your brother, or you had sisters as well? Most of the time it was my brother and I, but during the summers, because we used to work weekends, holidays, and summers with okay. my brother and I. When, when we, we know that got people, it was No, 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 that, 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 <laughs> how are you going to eat? <laughs> sure. How are you going to buy clothes? Yeah. So you don't make much money as a farm worker, so the money that my brother and I earned was pulled together and we would help buy clothes for our sisters. Um, and whatever activities, you know, extracurricular you wanted to do. So when we traveled north in the summers to the San Joaquin Valley, uh, we stayed at migrant camps. So my mother and one older sister and my youngest sister, we would all work you know, all together in the field. So, so wait, this is kind of remarkable because you get sent to college, even though, even still, right. on a farm worker's background. background. Yes. See that? No excuses, people. Just, let that inspire you, people. That's wow. what I say. You know? That's what I say. If, I, if I'm here and this is like, you know, great jobs. Um, what's the excuse, really? Yeah. It's perseverance, it's discipline, it's learning, education. I mean, everything that you encounter helps you in that work. I'll give you an example. When you work in the grapes, anybody who works out there in the fields knows the difference and the terms. Levantas de tabel, cortas un you know, uh, you gather figs. And so, when we're doing blood in, blood out, there's a scene where the guy that kills me asks a question, or I ask him a question, to find out if he is, in fact, who he says he is. And it isn't very obvious to the audience. And when I explained it to the director, Taylor Hackford, and Teddy Wallace, who played the character that kills me, yeah. he hit the, it hit a spot and said, okay, now we understand why this guy would make himself vulnerable enough to be killed by somebody who he's a war with. But when he talks about farm working, I brought my background into it. And so I let them know that when you work in the grapes, you cut grapes, you don't pick them. And so the question to him was, because he was talking about the short handle hoe and doing all this stuff, and I asked him, hey, Teddy, or Wallace, did you ever pick any grapes? Yeah. And he trick says, question. The trick question. And he says, no, I never picked any, but I sure cut me a bunch. No, he knew. So he knew. Right on. He knew. We'll, we'll, get it, we'll get more into blood in, blood out in a minute, um, please believe. Uh, I want to I pick it into your your. your Pass a little bit. You were born in 59, correct? 49. 49, 49. 1849. Uh, 1849. I'm a vampire. 173 years old right now. You look great, uh, by the way. Uh, but no, uh, I, 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 I wanted to go back a little bit. 
just to kind of understand the struggle, you know, um, what that might have been like. I myself coming from Puebla, yourself from Mexico, um, and so I just wanted to understand like your 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 background a little bit. You know what I mean? To see what what drove you. You know what I mean? And what was those things that that made a difference. You know what I mean? That because I'm sure that the struggle while you were out there on the field, you must have said, "Man, one day I'm going to be a fucking actor and I'm going to tear shit up." I mean, like you had to build something up, right? Well, one correction, and I was born on this side. Okay. I'm an American citizen by about 100 feet. Okay. <laughs> uh, but everything around me was geared towards manual labor. And my father, his kind of aspirations, because he was actually a painter by trade. He learned with the foremost painter in what I had a medical commercial painting. So he knew about mixing colors. When he came to the US, he couldn't get that kind of work. So a friend of him, his invited him to the fields and that's where he stayed. And so his kind of aspirations were, number one, well, when you leave school and you go in the army, so he would kind of groom us along that route. Okay. Even how to eat with your elbows off the table, he'd say, while well, you're standing in the me. And then he would say, So, as far as he was concerned, I was going to be a farmer, too. Now, did you go to the army? I did not. When I graduated <coughs> high school, 1968, went to Berkeley, and I went under a student deferment. But while I was there, they discontinued them and they implemented the lottery. My lottery number was 41. So I was prime and my classification was 1A. Which means? Your, your prime cut to go that right? as, as infantry, right? Yeah. So I waited and waited for the call. But me thinking, I'm going to mess with them. I'm going to say the hell with you. I'm going to join the Marines. <laughs> That was my, that was my thinking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Instead of saying, I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna go to Europe, and said, I'm gonna join the Marines. Yeah. But uh, I stayed like that for quite a while. I was never called. Wow. But at the time. Now we're brother, talking about the years of Vietnam, right? Talking about Vietnam, the Tet Offensive happened in 68, so everything was really getting hot and heavy. A lot of my friends went from my hometown. Um, but my older brother, who's, who's older by two years, yeah. he had enlisted in the Air Force. And he was stationed, thankfully, in California. So he served his term, his tour of duty in, at Vandenberg. And because I believe he was already in, maybe something like the Sullivan, Sullivan Law, where the only surviving son can be sent. Right. So. Years later, about probably about 10 years ago, I actually wrote and directed a stage production dedicated to Latinos in America's defense. It was four stories about four Medal of Honor winners who are real Latinos that served in World War I, II, Korea, and Vietnam. And I dedicated it to my brother's service in appreciation. That's respect. respect. People, you're you're got it locked right now with Enrique Castillo. I am your boy, Mellow Man Ace. This is the Havana Lounge podcast. Uh, some very, uh, uh, amazing stories being told right here, right now. Uh, I want you to get your questions ready for the legend as we move forward. Uh, but uh, right now, uh, wow, that's that's mind blowing. And then you put together the, the screenplay. And that was stage production. Stage production. Okay. We traveled it across the country. Now, were you already acting? When oh, you yeah. Did, when you wrote this? Oh, yeah. This, this was like uh, 10 years ago. What was your first acting gig? In LA? Anywhere. I'll tell you, th this is where preparation meets opportunity, okay? okay? I was a farm worker. I go to college and I meet Luis Valdez, whose company is El Teatro Campesino, farm workers theater. 
that got started on strike lines during the grip strike that says that Chavez yes. is a weapon. Absolutely. He's teaching the class. He likes my work, invites me to go to San Juan Bautista, where his company is now headquartered. Yes. I go down there, and then I eventually become a member of his company. It's a bilingual theater company. It's a stories about farm workers. Yes. And so that's how I got my Bachelor of Arts degree, because there was a program at, at Berkeley, which was uh, theater without walls. And so the idea was that you work in your discipline outside of the institution. Everything that you do, you have to document. So that then there is a panel that you go before that judges your presentation okay. and they give you either the thumbs up or the thumbs down. So now you, if you get the thumbs down, you clear it over? You have no you have no degree. No degree. And that's why you have to be very specific and understand that you choose this program willingly and understand that if you don't get you know approval, then you don't get your degree. So thankfully, woo, all of the work that I did, I took multi-track recording classes in San Francisco at Zotrope Studios with the engineer for the Grateful Dead. Uh, all the work that I did with uh, in Deathlifting Casino, all the programs. Do you remember the gig? Your, your character? Played? Several of them. No, in this one particular first gig, the very first game acting job professionally that I yeah. got yeah. was with a Death of Campesino because I was getting paid. It was in a piece called No Saco Nada de la Escuela. And I was actually playing an African American character wow. with blackface and yeah. a little derby hat. Yeah, what year was that? 1940? 1969. In 69 they were doing that still? It was. It was a it was a production. Wow. It was a skit yeah. that was these kids in school, and they were mixed nationalities. So we had white, we had brown, we had Asian, and we had black. Yeah. And so we didn't, there were no black actors. So we had to don the makeup for it. Yeah. Yeah. But it was all about empowering of now, each. Did you have to speak black? Slightly, but we did not. Uh, exaggerate exactly. in order to in order to humiliate or plagiarize. plagiarize it was more of a political statement because these kids we show them growing up yeah. and eventually empowering themselves mm -hmm. and turning the tables against the institution including the schools yeah. where the Latino would say I can communicate in two languages and you can only communicate in one. Who's the teacher teach? Yeah. You know? Now tell, tell me this. Um, you made a great point there. Um, how difficult was it in this time where a lot of Latinos weren't being casted on, you know, nobody on was. Film. Nobody was. Right. And everybody was, everybody, everybody was disenfranchised. Everybody was ridiculed. Uh, if you had an accent or, or a, a different last name or even a first name, you, you, you wouldn't be seen. Mm -hmm. was, this is at a time when Hollywood had the habit of, if they're going to get a, a Native American, for instance, they just get a white guy and paint him a little bit in red, right? Yeah. And things like this. Yeah. Mexicans put a charro hat on with a mustache, use that makeup, same thing with African American. Everybody across the board in those eras was doing the same thing. San Francisco Mind Troop, who were the premier mind group in the country, Ron, uh, led by Ron Davis, these guys were amazing minds. They did a piece called The Minstrel Show. And they had African American actors, white actors, and other actors in this production. They all wore these blue kind of light blue sequin outfits with white gloves yeah. and blackface. Even the African American, everybody had the black. Yeah. And it was all doing minstrels, mine, 
with the dialect. Everybody had to speak like an African American. Amazing. So you're going back, you know, to 1969. 1969. I was two years old, man. <laughs> I was two years old in diapers. You were doing your thing. Salute to you. Uh, guys, get your questions ready for the legend in the chat room. Um, once again, welcome to the Havana Lounge podcast. My guest tonight, of course, is Enrique Castillo. Um, let's, let's, let's move it up a little, a little bit. Let's get, let's get into the meat and bones of this thing, right? Uh, before, before we get into how you landed, uh, you know, blood in, blood out, uh, Deja Vu, maybe even Nixon, right? Um, let's let's talk about it. Yeah. Um, coming up now. You're coming up. You're, you're getting your chops as an actor. You're, you're going here. You're going there. You're meeting this one and that one. Um, what was the toughest part of that? Of that? Of that? Grind of that? Is it being away from the family now? Or is it you're, 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 you kind of got to move and shake, but you don't know where to, you're going next? Because it had to be, I can only imagine, in 1969, we're coming out of the uh, civil rights movements and all these things, right? So, so what was the, what happened to the hardest part of that? Well, you know, the decision to move to LA from the Bay Area, I was living in San Jose. I was okay. doing, actually doing music at the time. What do you play? Uh, well, I played guitar, acoustic guitar. I learned how to play the todo noche, upright bass. Okay, that was my uh, grandfather's instrument. Oh, cool. Yeah. I, uh, I play a little some percussion in the group, uh, wrote some songs, and then we recorded an album in 77 under, the, right? group, under the group's name, Flor del Pueblo. Okay. A lot of the music was, uh, we incorporated Afro-Cuban music because because my compadre was a uh, conguero. Okay. He was a gabacho, but yeah. he was a conguero that lived with the group in New York. Okay. And so he taught me percussion, all about LP and, you know, wheel, uh, wheel clave. Now this is when you came to LA. This is just before I came to LA. So I come to LA. Now this has this was the toughest part of that period for you. You would say because the, the, the movie because I was working at a job. My son had just been born, okay. you know. So the choice of leaving a secure job, coming to LA without any references, like you know, you can't present a a degree. You know, here's my college degree. Hire me for an acting job, or yeah. here's a letter of recommendation. I had no idea what a headshot was, resume. I didn't know anybody except before I came, a class was put together in Berkeley for professionals only being taught by a director from Hollywood. And so as a challenge, I took the course and I met some people there. One of them is a well-known actor now um, who works in, worked in a movie called The Right Stuff. And there was another guy who, who was a screenwriter, won an Academy Award for a film with Robert Redford called The Candidate. Yes. Fred Ward was the actor, he doesn't know. And you've seen him in a lot of films. Um, and so the, the, the drama coach said, you know, you've got, you got your chops pretty, pretty good and tag, so why don't you come to LA and I can set you up with this woman who runs a Latino kind of class for me, yeah. and that was Carmen Zapata, and I knew who she was. So I went and I hooked up with them. Uh, but then a guy in the class by uh, the name of Pepe Serra, very well known actor too, we had, we had auditioned for the same role, and he got it. But he had been in a state production that was written and directed by Luis Valdez. Your guy from over there. Yeah. Correct. So he told me, I'm going to do the movie, so there's going to be a role available. And you work with Luis. Yeah. So I went and auditioned. I just called up and I wanted to audition. Uh, there was some miscommunication initially by, at that time, we had answering services. 
There was no cell phone and you know, no thing, yeah. voicemail. So it took me a while to figure out that the, the call was not from Mark's paper form, but it was Mark paper forum. The place where I had this. Okay. So the offer was made. I accepted the role, and uh, that's where I met. I met Eddie Olmos, uh, Mike Gomez. We're going into the early seventies now. This is this is. I moved here in June of seventy-eight. I was oh, working in yeah. LA yeah. In, in that hit play in July. Yeah. So from one month, one month to the next, I got you got in the mix. Because again, I was prepared because I knew the roles that Luis, how he wanted it delivered. He he is very bilingual, so you know you have to be able to code switch not just in Spanish yeah. but into Caló also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. On the spot, on the fly, so. Uh, the show ran for a year in LA, uh -huh. so I worked for a year, got an agent out of it. His brother Danny was playing the lead, and then he left uh, to do the role in New York, and I took over the lead in LA, okay. and that's how I met my wife. <laughs> awesome. awesome. She was a dancer in the show. What's your really? And I, I'll tell you my, my first loving words to my wife. Where I can't repeat the one. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's let's keep the kids show up. Let's keep the kids running tonight. But right. I was in character. In the case you have to forgive me. Yeah. Can we can we get some questions? Yeah. Look like we filed up a pretty good there. Uh, the comment is uh, Jose Ramirez. Uh, Jose Ramirez. Uh, how was it like working on American Me? Oh man, wait, um, wait. Well, wait, wait, that's one of my questions. So hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's wait on the question. Hold on. Hold on, people. Let me get mine in first. Uh, so no one's coming. Okay. Okay, so um, tell me this, man. Um, now we're in the late seventies, early eighties. Up to that point, what was your least favorite aspect of it? Of, of the acting game, if you will, at that time, like, oh man, it's very competitive, or these fools over here are hating, or, you know, I'm not getting enough calls. Um, well, in terms of the, the continued effort to try and get in, yeah. there's something I, I was always told by my father when we were working in the field. Cuando te agaches, no te levantes. Because it's twice as hard to get back down. So in other words, you know, nose to the grindstone, and you move forward, and you just persevere, and you don't get up until you finish. Then you can get up, rest, or whatever. So you just plow ahead. That's one. Number two is a lack of respect, not just for the talent that we have, but the roles that were written. Because any role that is written in a movie script can be played by a Latino, except they don't cast you because of the because of the prejudice. Yeah. Hollywood has always had that that uh, virus underneath it. Yes. Yes, there, there has always been an element of, of uh, racism. Absolutely. Uh, as we as we discussed earlier in the early days. You would see them brown facing, black facing, stretching the eyes, putting feathers. And you see it sometimes, it's so ridiculous that sometimes you see a Western movie that's in color and the, the Indian character turns and all of a sudden you can see, you know, the taparrabo goes up and the thin white skin, you know, yeah, yeah. half of it is made up and half of it is not. Yeah, like the movies like Tarzan, for instance, you know, the classic example of that. So the lack of respect for the talent, uh, and I gotta say, I am so in awe and respect for people like Anthony Quinn, Gilbert Rowling, uh, Ricardo Montalban, all of these people of our cultura that had to endure all of that. Yes. There have been Latinos working and building this country 
before the American Revolution, Absolutely. during the American Revolution, and have never gotten the respect that they deserve. So I am eternally grateful for the opportunities that they've created. Absolutely. And that's why in my personal work, I pay tribute and respect to Latino military veterans, like the play that I wrote, four Medal of Honor recipients, real guys. And remember, these were kids when they went. Many of them lied about their age, 17 years old, and become heroes only to come back sometimes to lie and then go eat at a diner with a Medal of Honor and don't get served because they're Mexican. And that that's one of the reasons I wrote one of the characters in that play. But those are the two things that, that when I encountered them, I already kind of knew because I could see the lack of respect in the, in the projects that, yeah. like, yeah, that come out of them in the movies, mm -hmm. you know, with bad accents and bad teeth, and it's just terrible. It, 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 was, it was really depressing. And I, yes, I thought, okay, I want to go into that. And I said, you know, I'm going to dedicate myself to at least presenting these characters with dignity and respect. And so a lot of times I wouldn't go for auditions. And if you look at my resume, you will see that Montana in Blood and is probably within the 1% of all of the roles that I have done. Because I played lawyers, judges, police officers, doctors, and war heroes by choice. And it's been at, at a cost of, you know, financing, but at least I'm able to sleep better and I'm able to, you know, if I'm ever in front of those that have passed and they ask me, hey, what did you do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to be able to say, you know, I turned this shit down and that shit down. And when things, you know, I spoke up and I said, we deserve this. We burned it. There's no need for us to ask for permission. If I can get them to do a film that I write, well, I'm going to write it myself and do it myself, as well as many others that I know that are doing the same. Salute. Salute. Let's get right into it, man. I know everybody wants to know how you got cast before. Blood in, blood out. Let's get, let's get to it. Let's go. They don't want, they over there chiming off. They're like, let's go. Let's well, get into it. The question. Yeah. All right. Uh, a year before I got cast, I was working with a theater company, and they brought the script there, and I hated it. Um, Why? The Why only, did you hate it? because it was so stereotypical. The only character that I thought of or any dignity was Montana. A year later, I hear that the project is going on. And so my agent called me. And I knew just about everybody in town had been seen for the role. You name the actors, they were probably seen for it. I know one person who was working with the theater company too that had gone in for the role. So I go in, and they were already, they had already cast all of the other on the back. Yeah. It was, the movie was pretty much all cast, and they were looking for Montana. So I walk in there, and I sit down, and I start to talk to the casting director, and you know, he says, uh, you know, I, I just don't know if you're kind of right for this role. And uh, I happen to have a portfolio with several pictures in it. And he said, well, leave me your headshot. And so I opened it up, and I had a variety of pictures in there, and one popped out. And it was a, a pose that my wife had suggested. Is that right? I had been working out quite a bit, you know, so I was really pumped up. I was wearing, in the picture, a slingshot white t-shirt, right? I posed sideways, and I had that beard. Yeah. And then I had got a black uh, sash, and I wrapped it around como pirata, you know? And I went sideways, and I, you know, puffed up, and they took the shot. 
So the shot is there on the table, and he looks at it, and he says, wow, that's an interesting look. Who is that? <laughs> and I said, that's me. And he goes, really? He got the part based on the picture. <laughs> so he goes, he goes back into an office, and he comes back with Taylor Hackford, the director, with the picture. And he says, uh, I'm going to... I'm going to throw a, a monkey wrench into your plans. He says, I'm going to make your life difficult. I want you to do six scenes for me by tomorrow, and we're going to screen test. So I went home, and I had to learn six scenes. For those who've never acted, explain to them what that means. Because okay. I've done some acting. It's not easy. Uh, for actors, there are things that are called sides. And what they are are scenes or parts of scenes from the movie. Sometimes they're really in the movie, and sometimes they write them just for your audition. So they give you these sides, and it has all the dialogue for you and for the other characters. And you either memorize it for a screen test, you have to memorize it, because you're going to be on camera as if you're doing the movie already with other actors in there, in costume. For auditions, you can, the actor can choose whether or not they want to memorize, memorize parts of it, or just read it off the, off the, off the page. In this case, it was the actual screen test where I had to memorize all lines overnight come in and then work with the actors that had already been cast in the movie that you saw in the movie. And then there was uh, the scenes that I had to do were the scenes where we, where we uh, include Miklo into the Honda in the yard where he does his speech and I do the 500 years. And that's another thing you know, that I could add to that is that when I auditioned, it was, part of it was improvised. In other words, I had to come up with stuff. And so what I did was, I chose to include pre-Columbian cultural history into my character so that he began talking about a pre-Columbian concept of duality and inclusion within the Onda structure. And so I used the characters of Ometeoto and Omesiwato, the creative pair of the universe, to the indigena. And so the other actors in there probably didn't know what the hell I was talking about, but it got quiet. And so to Taylor, it was, you captured their attention, and that's what Montana has to do. So then with the scene with Niklo, in the cell where I tell him to get educated so he can get out of there. That was a great scene. Taylor Hacker brought me aside and he said, listen, I want to really get something out of this actor and I need your help. So give me something in there that really pushes him. I want to see the fire in his mouth. And I said, okay, I'll try something. So as I'm talking with him, uh, he's looking at me and he, you know, in his character and stuff, and he starts talking about feeling sorry for himself and whatnot, yeah. and I just reached over and I went, ah, oh, and I slapped him. And he just got startled. He didn't know how to respond. And I could see the fire in his eyes and everything got quiet also. And then he was able to really put some fury into his, his dialogue. And the actor, the director, I could see him over there. And he was, That's what I wanted to do. So after that, the, the, the audition was over. So I was in costume with makeup, with the cinematographer, lighting, and everything. And the cinematographer, by the way, Gabriel Beristan, the Gitano of Mexico, amazing and shot a lot of films. Taylor Hackford, and he has traveled a lot to Cuba to film. He just got back, and uh, he's got a film that's coming out now. 
he's shot for Del Toro, he's shot for Taylor, he shot Dolores Claiborne, and so many films, that, but yet he's not like as well known as say, an actor, you know? But he's an amazing, amazing talent. Did, did uh, I forget his real name, uh, Miguel. Damien Chapman. Did, did he hit you up after for slapping him? Like, hey, dog, like, did you have he, Yeah, he, he did. He did come up to me and he, he said, dude, he said, man, I was so, so tempted to, to just drop you, man. He says, yeah. but thank you because it worked. It worked. It really gave me something. <laughs> That's amazing. You hear yeah. it here first, people. That's amazing. Um, I, mean, I mean, I wouldn't do it in. In the movie, I wouldn't do that to another guy. Right. Yeah, because I, I, I didn't see that in the movie. No, you no. didn't slap the crap out of me. No. Yeah. No, my character wouldn't do that either. Yeah. No, you it. were very serious, and I was wondering because I've never met you before, so I was wondering if you were that serious all the time. <laughs> Most of like, this is gonna be a short interview. When I was uh, when I was working on weeds, yeah, and that character never smiled. He was. He was an enforcer. Wait, is that the show that pointed at them? Yeah, the bottom. Oh my god, yeah, that was him. Yeah, he was the guy that talked to the lady and then he talked to I was the enforcer. So yeah, love they, they, they caught on real quick uh, for the character and the intensity of what they wanted also. So we maintained that. Now what prison I'm sorry, I'm sorry. What prison did y'all film uh, Blood in Blood Out? It's like you came. San Quentin. Oh, San Quentin. Okay, question <laughs> about Blood in Blood Out. All right, let's go, let's go, let's go. All right, here we go, guys. Is there a scene in, in Blood In and Blood Out you would do over or would like to have done? Tony Mutado. Every actor is going to say, can I do it all over again? <laughs> there is always something that you, later on in retrospect, uh, realize, gosh, you know, if I only would have done this. Oh. And I remember Robert De Niro saying the same thing when he was doing Raging Bull, and he, he realized when he would go back to the corner at one point, he realized, my gosh, when I see real fighters, they're trying to relax, and here I was all pumped up. <laughs> he said, I should have done that over. And, and yes, you, you do things like that, that you feel later on, maybe they weren't as consistent with the character, maybe a little different delivery in the line. Uh, I know we struggled a lot with the delivery of uh, the fork chop line, for example, because that could easily turn ridiculous, you know? But uh, the sound guy we worked on, the director, Jimmy, the writer, the screenwriter, we all work on a lot of the dialogue to try and get it as authentic and as real as possible. So I do have those moments where you'd like to do it again, but then on the movie set, time is money, and that, that's about it. That dictates what you can and cannot do. Great question. Thanks, guys. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah. Okay, who is your favorite director? All of them. <laughs> That's right. So, you know, so I, while you guys were in San Quentin, were you guys getting hit up by the, the actual inmates and stuff like that? Or was it they kept them separated and let you use parts of the facility that they were in? How did that work? There were only eight of us actors in there. Uh, Even on the yard? The yard like shows. Eight. Yes. Uh, Although Jimmy, of course, and Jimmy, of course, had done prison time, and Danny, in fact, Danny, uh, Danny Trejo, that is, yeah. had been in one of the cells where we filmed. It was one of the cells. And so, obviously, when we were in there, both Jimmy and Danny were kind of like going through a PTSD situation at the time. You know, because it's heavy duty. It's heavy duty. Um, and so all of the supporting cast in there, the, the extras and whatnot, those were all real guys. And there's one thing 
Those were guys that were also real guys from prison. From prison. Yes. Yes. Wow. It's a working prison. So the actual warden is in the movie. He plays himself. He was a former gangbanger. And uh, he was actually looking at our performances also. And even while we were in there, he would get reports because he knows who the shot callers are in there. Yeah. And so we also had kind of a liaison, somebody that would report to us off the record what the real guys were saying about us. Okay. And I mean, I was kind of like a little stunned at one point because the real warden came up to me and he said, I want to have to tell you something. And I thought, oh boy, here it comes. And he said, I got the word that the guys giving you the thumbs up. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that could have went both ways. It could have gone both ways, but we, we made sure that we let them know ahead of time that we respected their, their situation. We didn't offend them by wearing the particular colors that they used. In reality, uh, Taylor Hackford was the only one that wore red in the movie. Nobody else, he doesn't allow anybody else to wear red. Not just because we were in San Quentin, but because when he, whenever he films, he wants anybody that comes onto the set to know that the guy that's wearing red is the director. So there's no mistake being made. But those are all real guys. Yeah, yeah. Shout out to Brian Brown, Tony Hurtado. Thank you guys. Uh, Great question. Do uh, you ever feel underrated, un un underappreciated as an actor for the skill set, skill level that you possess? No, I don't pay attention to that. Uh, I continue to work. That's about as you know, high an elevation as one can hope for. You get higher. Yeah. Uh, and then people start writing parts for you, so they recognize your value for the sure. project. Which, uh, which leads me to ask you about Deja Vu. <laughs> tell us a little bit about working with Denzel We were in New Orleans, and I heard from my sister. My mother had cancer. It was really hard to put it aside when you're being paid to deliver. And I didn't know if I could do it. I really didn't. That particular scene with Denzel, and I have to talk about my deceased daughter. And it's very difficult for me as an actor, and I know it is for others, to separate your personal from the professional. When you do that, for me, you begin to indulge and you emote unrealistically. And I did not want that to happen. And so I really, really struggled to do that scene. And I spoke to the makeup artist, and I asked her to please stand by because I, I asked her if she could help me out if I began to tear up. Um, and she agreed, and unbeknownst to me, the word got around. Um, and Denzel came up to me, and he said, Brother, whatever you need, I'm there. If you want to rehearse, let me know. Whatever you want to do. And that 
means the world to an actor or a star to say whatever you need because a lot of times the lead actor has other commitments he's got to be in the dressing room or whatever and he can't be there for you and so you're doing a scene with someone other than and so for him to to put himself at my disposal led the world to me and it was it was really really touching and then of course on top of that Tony Scott, who directed the movie, was very, very supportive. And for actors, <laughs> when you get the script and you do your due diligence and you do your work and you, you try to do your own little storyboard of how you see the scenes, how you want to play the scenes with stick figures. Well, Tony Scott, when I got the, the scenes from him, for the day, he's an artist. And so he did the sketches on my script so that I would know how he was going to shoot the scene. And that's the first time I'd ever gotten it. So I was like completely comfortable with how I already knew walking on set, how he wanted me to walk in, from which side of the camera, how far, and when everything was going to, the dialogue was going to start. And he's very generous. I mean, gift, gifts that he gives you. Um, when we did the premiere in New York, his very first question to me when I walked up to him to say hello, he asked me to go to So that shows you the humanity. Because it had been months it's like yeah. but he remembered that. You know? And I really appreciate that. And then, of course, he went too soon. You know? He took his own life. I was, I was completely stunned when, because we had talked about projects that we both had an affinity for, he had the rights to a story about Pancho Vida movie about Pancho Villa that they wanted to do. And I've always wanted to do, I w I've always wanted to play the character of Fierro, who was Pancho Villa's right-hand man. He's like Montana, except for the good side. He, he's missing the good part of it. For a reason. He's a human being. He has, you know, a good side to him, too. You can't just play the bad guy. Anyway, I appreciate you sharing that one of those I'm sorry about the tears, guys. sacrifice himself for on behalf of all of us, you know, be part of that. Um, I had actually met Oliver Stone prior to Nixon because uh, some time before he was going to do a project about uh, uh, Noriega. Okay. And I went in to read for a role of a bush pilot. Yeah. And uh, they wanted to hire me. But then he didn't do the project. So then I got a call that uh, he wanted to see me for an exit. And uh, so I went in. And uh, the interesting thing is that you get a very, very opinions about uh, him. And so I went in there and I had already met him. And I didn't know whether he was going to remember me or not. But when I went in, he did. And he said, yeah, I remember I brought you in for, for Vallega. I said, yeah, what happened to the project? Uh, you know, how I go this or that or whatever. But anyway, he says, uh, what are you here? 
you're here for for one of the Cuban characters, right? And I said, yeah, yeah. And I said, I, you know, I, I, oh, and then he, he said something about, yeah, I remember your audition for Noriega. And he said, yeah, man, you know, I don't know, man. You kind of like, said her tongue in cheek, you kind of like didn't do that great a job. <laughs> That's why, uh, that's why I want you for this thing. <laughs> yeah. And I said, oh, Oliver, I said, you know, that really hits hard, man, yeah. because I had, I, I was going to bring my JFK laser disc for you to sign, but now I'm going to burn it. <laughs> so we had a good laugh with each other, and uh, you know, the rest was, and then I got to work with um, uh, Ed Harris. Uh, and Ed and I had made our first film together yeah. with Charles Bronson. So he remembered me and you know we, we commiserated about that too. So your, your resume speaks for itself, my friend. Um, I'm in awe sitting here being able to, to have this time with you. You know what yeah, I mean? Uh, appreciate it, but you know the feeling is mutual, brother. You know the feeling is mutual. You do got a Cuban thing going on yeah. over there with the Guayabera. I was thinking about wearing my yellow hat too. And I'm like, nah, man, you know, man. Uh, but uh, we, have, we have a question or two we want to take right now. Uh, guys, go ahead and, and shoot them off. Okay. We are in the lounge and in the house on a Thursday with my man, Enrique Castillo. Nobody asked. Do you ever go back and visit the Mexico? Wow. I have not been to Calexico in at least three or four years. I was invited back uh, because they have a, uh, a group that does kind of like the Wall of Fame of uh, people from Calexico. Uh, and so they honored me with uh, being one of the leaves on the tree of uh, accomplishments. Well deserved, well deserved. Uh, so I visited for that. Uh, my mom, my parents have since passed, obviously. So I don't get a chance to go back. I have one sister that lives in Calexico. Uh, and one sister, my older sister, lives in El Centro. Uh, I have a sister that lives in San Diego, and my brother lives up in Fresno. You guys are all pretty spread out. Though. We're very spread out. And with my schedule, and in fact, with the current project I'm on, I have to travel out of town. I have to travel out next week again, so finding the time to get back there is pretty, pretty tight. Right on. I have a question. Okay, go for it. What's your question? Uh, well, uh, not more like a question, but like um, something that you can tell uh, to Chicanos, Mexicanos, Indígenas, and identified folks out there that are wanting to go into the acting business, the movie business. What what advice would you give them? There are many, many, many opportunities that are being opened now. Uh, case in point, there are many of us now, more of us now, that are in the Motion Picture Academy. Uh, however, even if we were the majority in the Academy, if there are projects that are not being done that include Latinos, we cannot vote for them. And so, the good thing is that with modern technologies, more and more young people are able to make their own films within their own homes or their own communities. The only difference is the amount of budget. And the thing about a movie is that you need time to be able to accomplish all of the shots that you need to make a really quality production and time is money. Money buys you the time to be able to cover a scene with a close-up, with a medium shot, with a long shot, with a master that covers two of us, with an over-the-shoulder shot, 
everything that puts you into the character so that you can get an extreme close-up and feel what the character is thinking. What's going on in the soul and in the mind of the character when you see it through their eyes. The eyes are the windows of the soul. And in order to get all of that, you need financing, but not necessary. If you're a young filmmaker, study filmmaking, watch films, as many as you can. Watch all genres of film, westerns, crime dramas, uh, comedies, what they call rom-coms, romantic comedies, everything. And at times, watch it and turn off the sound. Because when you do that, movies are motion pictures. That means the motion moves. And so you have to be able to tell a story so that everybody understands it without having to hear the actor speak. Sometimes it's very necessary, but many times the dialogue is the least important part of the movie because it's the inside of the character. The character is trying to hide what he's really thinking and feeling. So when you take away the sound, you can see the body language and what it's doing to the actor. That's number one. Number two, you have to remember this. If you choose to do it, that's exactly what you're doing. You are choosing to do this. Nobody is forcing you. Nobody is putting a gun to your head. And when you choose to do this, now you have two choices. You can be happy about it or you can be miserable because you are going to encounter challenges. It is an extremely competitive industry. And many, of, many people in the industry consider it, there are two perspectives, the arts and entertainment, and then there is the movie business, okay? So you're a commodity if you're an actor. If you're a filmmaker, your project is a commodity. So you have to also indoctrinate yourself into the movie business because there are sharks and there are sharks. And so there are a lot of people who have misguided intentions that will take advantage of you. But again, it's a choice. So look for the goodness in yourself and how you're going to Reflect that in your projects because when people see your project, it's going to reveal the character of the person making the movie. So whoever you are, it's going to reflect your soul. So I always want to do things with the best intentions, with the respect for not just of myself, my craft, my culture, but also my colleagues, I like to respect every person who works along with me on a movie set, whether they're the drivers, the, the catering, the craft services, the makeup, because it takes everybody to, to make happen what you see in a two hour movie. And it takes months to do it, most of the time, at the studio level. So you're in there working with a lot of people. And if you're not happy not making money, you're not going to be happy making a lot of money. So if you're in it for the money, there's a lot of other things that you can do. You can, you know, try to play basketball, make a lot of money there. You can create new kinds of shoes, anything that you can do. So when you choose to do it, do it, it's your choice. Okay? Interesting. Very well said. Very well said. Uh, the arts in general are typically like that. Uh, from music to acting, I've seen some athletes struggle as well. Um, yes. You know, so it, it's, it's no joke when you decide 
to make a check from sheer creativity uh, here at your doorstep every week or every two weeks. How we do it, um, it's an amazing trait. I do it, and uh, I love what I do with the music thing. Um, but you know, some people ain't cut out for this. Um, so that was a great explanation and a great giving of yourself on that event. Uh, tell me this. Tell, tell me about your, your project, The Ugly Little Monkeys. Uh, the title, Ugly Little Monkeys, translates to Ch Changuitos Feos. And uh, in 1964, there was an Irish Catholic priest that came out of New York. Uh, when he was ordained, he was sent to Tucson. And he heard mariachi music for the first time. And he fell in love with it. And he hit on the idea of starting a youth mariachi uh, out of the, the kids that would come to the church. Uh, that were altar boys or out of the community. Some of them were musicians, most of them were not. And he wanted to create a youth mariachi. And he did. He taught a lot of them music because he was a musician himself. He was a concert pianist. And he played along with people like Duke Ellington, Sarah Bonds. Uh, one of his good friends was Peter Nero, a jazz icon. And so he was very well versed in music, but not mariachi music. And at that time, there was no written sheet music for mariachi. So they had to learn everything by ear, by listening to records. And they got better and better and better and better. And eventually, they became, uh, he named them Los Changuitos Feos de Tucson, because that's where it happened in, in Tucson. Um, they became international sensations. Uh, they traveled on private jets to Disneyland. They performed for uh, Richard Nixon's inauguration parade. Wow. They performed for Mayor Daly in Chicago. They did a month or two in Universal Studios. And yeah, I remember, this was nine-year-old kids up to the age of 18, because when they graduated from high school, they had to leave the group. Sort of like menudo. Basically, uh, yes. And uh, while they were at the time, at the time, mariachi music was not at the level where it is respected now. It was mostly ridiculed in movies, or you only heard them strung along in bars, and very, very, very little appreciation for the art form, the genre. Uh, and these kids with this group got so good that they rivaled any popular mariachi. In fact, Ruben Fuentes, who is the director of Mariachi Vargas de Tecalitlan, credits the, the Changuitos Feos members for creating the popularity of Mariachi Vargas in the United States. So that's how impactful these kids were to where Mariachi is today internationally. Now you see Mariachis in China. I've seen Mariachi flashbacks in Spain. Woohoo, see, they love it too. In France, in Australia, in Japan, mariachi, the members of Mariachi, the Changuitos Fields at Tucson, two brothers, Randy Carrillo and Steve Carrillo, created Mariachi Cobre. Mariachi Cobre has been playing at Epcot Center in Disney World for over 37 years. All starting from those Changuitos Fields that took song. And not only have are they accomplished musicians and has given us this legacy for this genre of music, in, as individuals, they became renowned musicians and also renowned for other aspects in life, like becoming doctors. 
well-received politicians, federal level. Uh, one became a scientist that helped launch the Hubble telescope. One member, Gilbert Vélez, became only the 10th down in Kenpo Karate that teaches on an international level. He was, a, he was a protege of Ed Parker, who is the progenitor of Karate in the United States. That's what these individuals became because of the discipline that they learned playing mariachi music because to them, it's not just about playing music, it's about education. And so they have made that a part of their legacy is to teach success through mariachi music. And now we see the results of where mariachi music is now. Now, are, are you directing this? I am co-directing with my partner, David Valdez. Yeah. He's out of Tucson. He grew up with some of these guys. Uh, Two of the other three, you see one, two of the other partners that we have that are part of the production team, they're both uh, out of Tucson. Yeah. Um, I'm the only one from LA, although Thelma Gutierrez, who we're used to be a journalist, she lives in LA, but still has family in Tucson. Tina Huerta, who is our associate producer, she lives in Tucson. So that's why I travel so much to Tucson. Now, these guys were contemporaries as kids with Linda Ronstadt. Linda grew up with these guys, and the priest, Father Charles Rohr, was a good friend and used to visit and play music with Linda's father. So if you remember Linda, Linda recording Canciones de Mi Padre, her father was a very close friend of Father Charles Rohr who started Los Changuitos Fields in Tucson. Now, I, in I, fact, I, we're drinking buddies. If I'm not mistaken, Linda Rossa was a Latina. She is Mexican-American. Yes, yes, okay. Now, I believe you're, you're doing a, a crowdfunding for, for this film, yes? It is correct. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing there with that. We, we what we're trying to do is, we're trying to raise some funds so that we can bring back the original members who are now, some of them retired, but some of them are still accomplished musicians, and they have agreed to come together again and record music that they recorded then, and also to add new music that is going to be arranged by Steve Carrillo, who is one of the original members and is now the director of Mariachi Cobre. In, in Florida. His brother Randy actually started Cobre. He's now retired from Cobre. But then there was another member, Mac Ruiz, who also retired from there. And so we want to bring them all together, house them in Tucson, and take them into the studio to also record because Los Changuitos fails still exists today, the organization. And we would like to bring people that have graduated from Changos that are still part, they have started their own mariachis across the country. And we would like to bring them back together, young mariachi students to record and to play with the original Changuitos films to show the legacy of Los Changuitos Fells at Tucson and how they've inspired generation after generation and put mariachi music where it is today. These guys have never been thanked for that. Many of them feel like they have been forgotten. Uh, they've had, some of them have led tragic lives. Uh, there were suicides. And so the story, the documentary, is to put highlight on these kids that had to deal with all of that adversity with an alcoholic priest who berated them and did terrible things to them. As kids, they had to be their own chaperone because many times he would not show up at shows. 
he would show up intoxicated. And these kids, nine to the most I, 18. I heard a little bit about, about this. Now, I think he sexually molested some of the numbers taken, yeah? Yes. And we have to say yes. Now, that is a part of the history and legacy of the project, but it is not their entire experience. Sure. And so the focus is, yes, this happened. Terrible thing that happened. And we have to address it. Sure, sure. You, you don't want to avoid it. Right, right. But these guys did a hell of a lot more to grow the movement of the to, future. To put us where we are to say, hey, look where my hands are yeah. now. You know? it sounds like an amazing project. I wish you all the best with that, my brother. Yeah, so if you can, go to yeah. uglylittlemonkeys.com. There's a donate button there. Appreciate anything, anything that you can send. I don't know if there's a limit, five bucks maybe, but hey, five bucks. You know? I'll be sending money for that, that's for sure, myself. Tell me this, switching here just a little bit. Uh, what, what does a day in the life of, of Enrique Castillo look like? I get to do things like this. <laughs> I have been wanting, I have been, up, I have been wanting to meet this man for so long, ever since. I mean, Cypress Hill, and, you know, all that stuff. But everything he's done after that, you know, coming from what it's like, you know, Chalitos Hills, right? Yeah. You got Mentirosa, yeah. And then you got this flowering of stuff yeah. that came out of that seed. Yeah. And it's. And then what you're doing now, and then you got the wine thing going, you know? Yeah. You got Lily, you got kids, and yeah. I mean, you're bringing a lot of people into this. This yeah. is this is my greatest joy in, in, in my life, is creating so that others can have opportunity. That's a lot of what we do, yeah. My greatest joy has been to write something, to hear young people, actors play heroes and watch the joy in their faces not having to play you know the derelicts of our of our society all the time and yet after that be able to write them a check yes so that they then can do that for others sure. that's the paying it forward paying it forward watching them just glow and my kids too i mean my son my oldest, he's watched me and grown up with it, and now you know he's acting. And right now, he's in a production of American Mariachi. In uh, they're doing it at the mission in San Juan Capistrano, and he's playing the Viguena in the show. Now that's the standard bass. No, no, no. That's the, the oh the violin. Piccolo. No, no, no. Oh. It's, it's like a guitar shape, but smaller, with a oh, like a piccolo. It's like a like a, a like a mandolin. Okay. Okay. Kind yeah, of yeah, shaped yeah. a little bit like a mandolin. Okay. Very very important to to the music. Yeah. So I bought him one because I knew he was going to be in the show. But think yeah. about it, you know. Uh, now that's another generation, you know. Another My daughter is in the industry. Some people have seen her on on uh, shows like what did she do recently? Good doctor. Uh, the good doctor in CIS, and uh, so that, that that's a great thing to see other generations, your sure. people that I've worked with, their kids, you know, being in, being involved. So paying it forward, yes. And if I can help young filmmakers, uh, sometimes they call and they say they've done a project and they say, man, you know, I wish I could have you in the movie. And I said, well, why don't you call me? <laughs> Right. Why did you call me? You know, they, they just think that well, somehow you're you're untouchable or unreachable or yeah. you know uh, the price isn't right or what have you. But yeah. you know that's why we do it too is to help help others. Get down, man. Get down. Stop that messing around, people. Enrique Castillo is my guest tonight. This is the Havana Lounge podcast. I want to send a shout out to my man Reg Evans up in. Modesto area, I want to say, good brother Dan, and shout out to my own girl Abby Losas uh, in the chat room as well, who says she's a big fan of your stuff. She's also from Calexico. Um, 
as uh, as you are. Yeah. So we are Kalesia. Yeah, that's what she called it. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, is, there, is there anything else that you want to talk about while I have here? Uh, well, as far as other than monkeys, again, other than monkeys.com. <coughs> Appreciate anything. Uh, we are looking at a fall 2022 premiere of the project. Uh, we have we just brought in a very well known uh, personality as an executive producer. We're going to be making uh, sending out a press release this coming week to announce that we're thrilled today to have that person on board. You all, I'm sure, have, have seen the work. Um, I'm flying out there next week to Tucson to shoot some more stuff. Uh, and uh, looking forward to coming back with the metal man and doing it again. Yeah. This is, this is, uh, no, I appreciate that. Uh, I, want, I want to do something off. I want to play a word association with you. This is where I'm going to say a word or a name, and then you give me the first thing that comes to your mind, right? Just remember that I have a relaxed brain. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right, funny guy. Hey, if the acting doesn't work out, you got a job as a comedian right here every Thursday night. All right, so here we go. Uh, what does it mean to be Chicano to you? Heart and soul, brother. Heart and soul. I'm Chicano to the max. Benjamin Pratt. Consummate professional. Ben and I did the uh, the tour, the release of the uh, the uh, video release, the eight. What is it? Eight. The, the, not the, the tape version. Of, <laughs> go back so far. But he and I did the eight track. Not the eight track, but the cassette. Okay. The cassette release of it. And we were on the road with it, and uh, I got to know him personally very well. I never got to work with him in the film, but I could see, I was convinced that Ben is Chicano. Yeah. His performer. Yeah, see, uh, Lily told me he was like, he's, he's, he's Peruvian. Peruvian, yeah. He's Peruvian, I think his, his father is, I think Dutch or something like that. Right. Yeah, but man, he did his due diligence, yeah, he did his work, yeah, he's so all hats on to Ben. Okay, we are moving along. Blood in, blood out. Gratitude. Tyler Hackford. Taylor. Yeah, really good guy. He talk about top of the list, eight class directors in Hollywood. Great guy, you know, and then he has a great choice of wives. <laughs> Ellen Mirror. Oh, man. Appreciate you bringing Thank you for your time. Oh. Love being here, man. Appreciate you coming down, doing this, sitting with me, telling us about your life, and your journey, your dream, your goals, and most of all your accomplishments. Guys, it's been a complete honor for me uh, to be sitting here with, with Enrique uh, for this time. I hope you've enjoyed this, tonight's show. Uh, we are the Havana Lounge Podcast, man. We want to welcome you to come back next week. Uh, tell a friend, tell two friends, and tell two friends. And let's blow this thing up, yes? Um, that's it for me. Uh, Exposure, you good? Lily, you good? I'm good. Everybody in the back, you good? Make some noise. Good. I see my man Callie is in the house. Cal is in the house. Biggie is in the house, most definitely. I am your boy, Mellow Man Ace. Thank you for spending your time with me and us. And uh, like I like to say at this time, in the words of the great... Curtis Mayfield, don't forget, people, that your dream is your only scheme. So move on up and keep on pushing. I'm Mellow Man Ace. This has been the Havana Lounge Podcast. Join me next week when my guest will be Rock and Roll Hall of Famer. Yes, indeed, Rock and Roll Hall of Famer. Raheem of Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five will be with us. All right, so until then, peace, love, and so. I'm just kidding. Peace out, everybody. Bitch, you know it. Yeah. <laughs>